Amen. Thank you, Scott. And we, uh, we know a man who can. That's why we're here this morning. Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 15. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. If you don't have your Bible this morning, we're going to try to get most of these verses on the screen. Or I'm sure somebody near you would mind if you looked on with them. Luke, chapter 15. We have uh, some exciting things coming up. We always like to do some kind of family series in kind of that Mother's to Father's Day stretch. Uh, a lot of us have family in. Uh, our minds are just sort of on that. And, and this Mother's Day, which is also our baby day, the day we begin a, a fundraiser also for the Pregnancy Resource Center, um, we're going to begin a series called Seasons of Life, God Willing, and talk about the different challenges and opportunities you have at the different phases of your existence. And I'm really excited about that one. But I am awfully excited and have very much anticipated our time together this morning because I want to speak to you about what is perhaps the most famous story that ever fell from the lips of Jesus Christ. It has commonly been referred to through the centuries as the story of the prodigal son. And we're going to be camping out there these next two weeks. Luke chapter number 15. Let's read this gorgeous story. And Jesus said, verse 11, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took his journey into a far country, and there he wasted his substance, his inheritance, with riotous, or literally reckless living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want, in need. And he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country. And this citizen, this man he was working for, sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain or would have liked to have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said... How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and he had compassion. And he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in thy sight I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found And they began to be merry. Verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And the older brother was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated or pleaded with him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Daddy, I did what you told me to do. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured your living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And the father said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. But it was meet, it was right, that we should make merry and be glad. 
For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Father, I ask you now for the power of the Holy Spirit on this message. God, today and tomorrow morning as we all go back to work, we will be bombarded with things that we can see and touch and taste and feel. And we confess to you today our need to see you. We need for you to be so real. And we confess that very often the eyes of our heart, our soul, are so closed. Oh God, use your word today. Penetrate our defenses, our excuses. And let your mercy and grace come down, Lord. We look for you. Get glory in this place. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This text is so powerful. So absolutely jam-packed with meaning. We preachers find it irresistible. Most of you, if you've been in church any time at all, you have heard dozens and dozens of sermons and lessons on the story of the prodigal son. The eminent British theologian and preacher G. Campbell Morgan said this, Among all the things that our Lord said, none is more wonderful in its light and its shade, its color and its glory, than this. I absolutely agree. But I believe there are at least two ways in which we have misunderstood this parable. At least two ways in which we have looked at it wrong and missed out on a blessing. The first one is this. I think we're very uh, prone to misunderstand the depth of this story. In other words, I think we can say, what a beautiful story Jesus gave of a father and a son and of undying love and of grace that would accept him just as he is. All of that is true. All of that is wonderful. But I want you to remember our text said that this was a parable. The word parable literally means to cast alongside. And whenever Jesus spoke a parable, he was taking something familiar, something people understood in their day-to-day lives so that he could set something unfamiliar, something spiritual alongside it and help us to understand. And friend, I believe in this parable that Jesus gave, he is describing the condition of every human being who has ever lived on this earth in the story of these two brothers. He is giving in in short order, in microcosm, in 30-something verses, the story of this entire Bible from cover to cover. If you think of all of Jesus' teachings throughout the Bible as a lake, this story of the, the prodigal son is the clearest point in the lake where you can see all the way to the bottom if you look hard enough. So I think we're prone to underestimate its depth. But I think we are also very prone to limit its application. And here's what I mean. We call this the story of the prodigal son. And very often our application is to those who have lived on the fringes of society, those who have gone the furthest into drugs and alcohol, those who have gone the furthest into prostitution and pornography. We talk about how individuals kind of on the fringes of everything who've gone that far, hey, Jesus can save you. And that's good and that's right and that's applicable. But I think we miss the larger intent of this passage if we're not careful, and that is this. Look at chapter 15, verse 1. Look at who he was speaking to. Look at how this whole thing set up. Then drew near unto Jesus all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Now, there you find what we would commonly refer to as the prodigals. These were the tax collectors, hated of their own countrymen, men who were frauding other people at every turn. You also had what the Bible simply refers to as sinners. This was the drunkards. This was the prostitutes. This was the people who had shunned all of their religious background as Jews and had sought the path of self-indulgence. I'm going to be free. I'm going to cast off your parameters. I'm going to live how I want to live. And by the way, I find it fascinating. Those type of people were always attracted to Jesus. Throughout your Bible, listen, 
They wanted to be near him. They wanted to hear what he had to say. They wanted to eat with him. They just wanted to be close to him. Those people, far from feeling unaccepted by Jesus, always did what they did in the text. They drew near unto him. And in this instance, Jesus was eating with them. By the way, in that culture, that was the ultimate sign of fellowship and acceptance to eat with someone, so much so that it offended some people. Verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Here's the picture. On the absolute opposite side of the spectrum were the scribes and Pharisees. These were the religious folks who interpreted the Mosaic law as strict as they possibly could and tried to apply it down to every nuance of life. In other words, they hadn't cast off any restraints. They had added restraints. They were extremely moral, extremely clean living. And these individuals see Jesus eating with these people, and they believed you were defiled by just being in the presence of them, just being near a prostitute, just being near a drunkard, kind of like infected you morally. So believing this, they're looking at Jesus and saying, why on earth? Would you, who are supposed to be this teacher, this this rabbi, why would you eat with people like that? Verse 3, and Jesus spake this parable unto them. Unto who? Unto the folks who had gone the distance to to self-indulgence. I'm going to find happiness wherever I can find it, casting off all restraints but he was also speaking to people who had sought their happiness in moral conformity. I'm going to be so good and so right and so proper that I can earn the favor of God. These were the people he was talking to. And my friend, listen, you can effectively find every human being who's ever lived on this earth at one point sought their happiness in one of those two roads. I will either indulge my appetites and I'll find my satisfaction in the next sexual partner, in the next experience, in the next job, in the next promotion, in the next raise, in the next sport. I'm going to find happiness without anyone's laws. Or folks who have said, you know what, I'm going to live so clean and so right and so true and with such high ideals that I will find happiness in that. Every human being, the Bible says, that has ever lived has fallen into one of those two categories, most of us both at some point. Tim Keller, in one of his books, gave a shocking quote, at least I found it shocking, when he said this. There are two ways to be your own Savior and Lord. One is by breaking all the moral laws and setting your own course. And the other is by keeping all the moral laws and being very, very good. Within this story, Keller writes, Jesus teaches that the two most common ways to live are both spiritual dead ends. Jesus' purpose, he writes, is not to warm our hearts, but to shatter our categories. And that is why, my friend, though this has been very often called the story of the prodigal son, I believe far more accurately to the text when Jesus said there was a certain man who had two sons and he did it on purpose. I want to entitle our time together over these next two weeks, The Two Lost Sons. The Two Lost Sons. And this morning, with God as our help, we're going to look at the lost younger brother. And next week, the lost older brother. Chapter 15, and here in a moment, we'll pick up in verse 11. Before we do, let me tell you what is not in the text, and that is our story begins in the father's house. We don't know a whole lot about this family. We have absolutely no word whatsoever about the wife and mother. Maybe she had already passed away. Maybe... Jesus simply moved her to the shadow of obscurity to make the point with these three individuals. We don't know. What we do know is there was a father with two boys. And we can pick up very clearly inferences from the text. This wasn't an abusive, difficult home like some of you grew up in. 
This is a home with a very loving father. He loved these boys. He wasn't afraid to show them affection. He wasn't afraid to speak to them words of affirmation. We find from the text that this home had ample provisions. The father had resources. He had land. He had money. I don't believe these two boys had ever wanted for a meal. They never wanted for shoes on their feet and clothes on their back. I believe he probably indulged many of their wants as well as their needs. We also infer from our text that this this father was a follower of God who had set up some parameters in his home but who had done the right thing, the thing that we parents need to constantly strive for. He had not raised his kids in a religiously confining household. He had sought their heart instead of just their obedience. He had given them some freedom to make some mistakes. He'd given them some freedom to learn. He'd given them some freedom to grow up into good uh, citizens and good Christians and good adults. But despite all these advantages, despite all these facts, we find the departure of the younger son in verse number 11. And Jesus said a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions, portion of goods that fall to me. In other words, give me my share of your estate. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took his journey into a far country, and there he wasted his inheritance, his substance, with riotous, reckless, self-indulgent living. There was a departure. I think a lot of us have heard this story so many times. I think we've read it so many times, if we're not careful, we tend to breeze past how shocking this whole instance would have been to Jewish ears, how scandalous, how disgusting it would have been to them. You see, in that day and in that culture, there were all sorts of biblical laws as to the inheritance. The first law was this, the inheritance was given only after the father, the patriarch, had died. And when that father died, when he passed away, there was a double portion that would be given to the firstborn, to the eldest son, and then the other brothers would divide what was left. In this case, there were two boys, so at the father's death, the older brother would get two-thirds of the estate, the younger brother would get his one-third. But this young man comes to his father. It says, Father, I don't want to wait until you're dead. I want my third right now. By the way, in that day, most of their resources were not liquid assets. Their resource was all bound up in their property. And to a Jew, the land was everything. They didn't feel even like the land belonged to them. They felt like they belonged to the land. Fathers would pass it down to sons for generations. And effectively, what this young man is saying is... I wish you were dead now. I wish you would give me your land. I wish you would give me what you have right now. He was saying, I want your things, Father, but I don't want you. One author put it this way. His relationship to the Father has been a means to an end of enjoying his wealth. And now he is weary of that relationship. He wants out. He'd been using daddy to get what he wanted. And now he wanted this father to not be a part of the picture at all. Give me what's mine now so I can go. And listen to me, in that day and in that culture, and I think the people listening to this, particularly those scribes and Pharisees, were probably on the edge of their seat at this point to hear what Jesus was going to say next because that father would have been every bit in his rights to not only completely disown that son for the request, he would have been within his rights to do it with physical blows. But that's not what he does. Verse 12 says, and he divided unto them 
is living. I've never seen this before, but that word living is the Greek word bios. It means life. He tore his life apart to let the youngest son have his third and the oldest son have the rest. That meant he would be utterly disgraced in that community and utterly shamed by his son. But out of love, he does it without hesitation. The young man's been dreaming for a long time now of what he'd do if he had those resources. What he'd do if he could be out from under daddy's control and daddy's religion and daddy's rules. If I could get out here, if I had this money, I could sleep with who I want. I could experience what I want. I I could double my wealth in this way. I could be someone. I could be powerful. I could be popular. He'd gotten tales, no doubt, from the far country of what a young man could experience if he only had the resources. And now the land being sold and money in pocket, the Bible says he goes and he wastes. He spends his substance and riotous living. By the way, it, it's been one of my joys to see this group right here of our young people coming along and filling up these first two rows. Let me tell you what I'm afraid we don't tell you all often enough. There was an entire period of this young man's life he was having the time of his life. Anybody that tells you there's not pleasure in sin and not pleasure in freedom and not pleasure in doing what you want, when you want, how you want, is lying and selling you something. He wouldn't have done it if there wasn't attraction in it. And there's a whole period of his life, man, he's the life of the party. And when you have money, the Bible says, people will think well of you. They want to be around you. They want to party with you. They want to go with you. And he's wearing the best clothes and he's driving the equivalent of the best car. And he's got these resources and he's spending them like there's no tomorrow. And that's the story of his departure at first. But tomorrow comes as tomorrow always comes, and he has the discovery. Look at chapter 15, verse 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want, in need. By the way, I believe there is a world of information and a great deal of time between verses 14 and verses 15. Things aren't all that bad at first. He didn't have the money he had. He can't party quite as hard as he did. And some of his friends drift out to the perimeter of his life. But hey, he's still got clothes and he's still got food and he's still got freedom. And it's still better than what he felt he was experiencing back there with his father. But pretty soon, he's having to sell off the clothes. Pretty soon, he's having to sell off the possessions. I would imagine he got addicted to some things there in the far country, and he has to have the resources to fuel the addiction. See, the thing is, friends, these these freedoms... Dig trenches in your heart and mind that crave filling. And every week, most every week, we hear from someone who comes and says, Preacher, I, I, I started out using this drink or using this drug or experiencing this thing. And listen, now I'm, I'm caught in it. And the thing that I was using is using me now. You know, I've likened it to almost like that fun house hallway where you start out and everything's wide open and everything's ample space and everything's freedom. But as you walk down that hall, the walls get tighter. The ceiling and the floor come together. And by the end of it, you're so strained and cramped and and constrained You can't even turn around. 
And this young man finds out what everybody who fi- finds out who walks the path of self-indulgence long enough finds. It always pays off in counterfeit money. It always hangs you out to dry before it's all said and done. Verse 15 is when he gets to the bottom. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He's trying to find some work to survive. And this individual sent him into his fields to feed swine. Friend, listen to me. Don't take that lightly. For a Jewish boy to be in the hog pen was the depth of despair, was the depth of disgust. We could liken it to some young woman finding herself driven into the industry of hardcore pornography. We could liken it to some young man being absolutely addicted to heroin and so strung out he can barely move. This boy is at the absolute bottom just trying to survive. Verse 16, he would fain have filled his belly. He he would have eaten what the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. The lights of the party have gone out. The friends have all gone home. And it's just him now. Verse 17. I think this has been the story of a lot of us. A lot of us in this room. And when he came to himself, you remember that day in your life where you realized mom and dad weren't near as big idiots as you thought they were? Remember that day in your life where all the things you'd heard about the price of this came down? He came to himself. And he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough in despair and I perish with hunger? And he makes a plan. I will arise and go to my father and I'll say unto him, Father, I've sinned, look at this, against heaven and before thee. Listen, I don't believe, as some commentators have tried, I don't believe he's just getting a line together to, to go and get more resources from his father. I believe this guy... He has had life so crush him, he's learned a lesson, and he knows there's probably very little hope of going back now, but he knows he's done wrong to his dad. He knows he's done wrong to God. Father, I've sinned against heaven before thee. Verse 19, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Now look at this. Make me as one of thy hired servants. All my life I've thought that meant he was saying, hey, hey, dad, let me come back is just one of your employees, okay? I don't, I don't need favored status. Just let me, like, bring people clothes. Let me fold. Let me cook. Let me... But I don't believe that's it at all now. Hired servants in that day were various kinds of tradesmen and craftsmen who lived in local villages and earned a wage. Understand what this young man is asking. Daddy, I know. I have so shamed you and my family that I can't be your son anymore. I know I've gone so far you can't take me back like this. But if you'll help me get an apprenticeship, if you'll help me learn a trade, I was too good to do it before, I'm not now. I will start earning money and gradually paying you back. Where one day, maybe, you could call me your son again. One day, maybe, you could not think so ill of me. And he makes this plan. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. I think every day his daddy had been roaming the fields waiting. I think every night his daddy sat out on the porch hoping. 
And a long way off, he sees a silhouette on that horizon. And he had compassion. And he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. Oh, friendless, I read this this week and it moved me so much. As a general rule, distinguished Middle Eastern patriarchs did not run. Children might run, women might run, young men might run, but not the potter familias, the dignified pillar of the community, the owner of the great estate. He would not pick up his robes and bare his legs like some boy. But this father does. He runs to his son and showing his emotions openly falls upon him and kisses him. Listen, the Greek indicates he didn't kiss him on the cheek. He showers his son with kisses. There's a verse in one of the songs we sing that talked about God coming and meeting us, and it used the phrase sloppy wet kiss, and the Christian community was so scandalized by that, so upset that it would use that terminology to describe sovereign God that they added a different verse. And friend, listen, I wouldn't dare to describe God is saying, listen, I'm that father. God is saying, I'm that daddy. That's the way I react to you. I wouldn't dare describe God as pulling up his robes and running like mad and showering us with kisses, but Jesus did. Here comes the father. Now, here's the thing. He would have been absolutely within his rights to greet his son with a noble walk. And all right, son, glad to see you back. But before we accept you back in, there's going to be a probation period here. Let's see if you can clean it up. Let's see if you can do a bit better. You've shamed me once. I'm not going to let you shame me twice. Let's see if you can be a better son than you were before. Do you understand that this kid, the stench of him... I met a man almost a year ago, and one of the first times I saw him here in Grand Prairie was on Main Street, digging through the dumpster at McDonald's. He came to a couple of our events, and and some of you would no doubt recognize him. And I'm sad to say, my reaction at first to him, the stench of that man, the smell of urine, the smell of the street smell of all that time without a bath, three feet away was like a wall. It was overpowering. I'm sorry to say the last thing on my mind was to embrace him and put my lips on his cheek. This father doesn't say, son, when you clean it up, son, when you're a little bit better, son, once you've had a shower, son, once things have have gotten a little bit more acceptable, I'll take you. He embraces him in his filth. He kisses his face and puts his lips against that vile hog pen skin. He takes him just like he is and treats him like he never left in the first place. And I think the son's overwhelmed, man. I think he is weeping now. And he can barely get out his speech, but here's what he says. 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. And he's about to bring out the part of the Lord. I mean, Father, j- just make me like a servant over here. I'll try to pay you back. He can't even get it out. 22. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. That's the father's robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. That's the sign of sonship. Put shoes on those filthy, broken, bloody feet. And bring hither the fatted calf. You might have that once in a lifetime. And kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Friend, listen to me. He not only accepted him as if he'd never sinned, He put his own robe around his shoulders and treated him like nobility. And he feasted with his boy. And listen, 
I love the fact where the story started in the father's house, that's where the story ends, back in the father's house. There's one part of the story that I had never seen before and frankly I had wondered about. You see, I left out a portion at the beginning of this entire thing that I I think Jesus didn't live out and it's awfully important. You see, when Jesus looked at these two groups of people, the one who were living in self-indulgence, trying so hard to be happy like this young brother had tried to be happy, and this other group of people living in moral conformity, trying to earn God's blessing, trying to indemnify God so he owed them something, doing their very best to be clean. He didn't speak only the parable we just read. He spoke a parable in three parts. Look at verse 1. Hang with me a minute. We're getting somewhere, and it's an important somewhere. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And by the way, he's speaking with irony and sarcasm now, because everybody needs repentance. Verse 8. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece... Doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And then he said, a certain man had two sons. I've always wondered how that fit together. I want you to note all three stories are similar in that something or someone was lost. Story number one, a sheep was lost. Story number two, a coin was lost. Story number three, a son was lost. In all three stories, the thing that was lost was found. In all three stories, The man, the woman, and the father rejoiced that the lost thing or person had been found. But there is one profound difference between the first two parts of this parable and the third. In the first story, when the man lost his sheep, he went looking for it. In the second story, when the woman lost her coin... She went diligently seeking it. In the third story, the young man goes into a far country and no one comes to get him. I believe that would have left massive question marks in the mind of the audience to whom Jesus spoke. Why did no one come get him? Why did they leave him in the far country? Why the first two stories and the change in the third? And friend, I want you to realize something. You remember that when the father divided up his inheritance, he divided it all among both sons? He gave one third to the younger son. He gave everything else to the older brother. All of those resources were technically under the older brother's control. And it would have taken some money to go find the little brother. It would have taken some some kind of means of travel. It would have taken some provisions. It would have taken some help. It would have taken some resources to go and find him. And I believe in in the minds of this audience, they would have thought, why didn't the older brother go look for his baby brother? Why didn't he go find him? He had the resources. He had the ability. But here's what we find. 
the older brother was a Pharisee as truly as the Pharisees at the beginning of our text. And he didn't want to pay the price to go and seek even his own flesh and blood. I believe that story would have left that audience wishing for a different kind of elder brother. And my friends, I'm so glad to tell you we have a different kind of elder brother. Listen, the story of this Bible begins in the Father's house in a garden called Eden. God was loving and he gave them everything they desired and everything they wanted. And he gave them freedom, but he gave them parameters. And listen, our mother and father, our federal head, the the one who we're just like, came to the point where they said, God, we want what you can give us, but we don't want you. We want your provisions. We want the breath in our lungs. We want the blood in our hearts. We want the garden. We want the fruit as long as we don't have to have you. And they rejected their maker. They rejected their God. And friend, lest we confine that to some 6,000 years ago, that's our story. The Bible says in Romans that we've worshipped the creation more than the creator. Oh God, I want you to bless me. Oh God, I want to do what I want and go where I want and seek what I want. But I don't want you. That's all of our story. And friend, there's not a person in this place if you've lived any time at all. When we talk about the price tags of sin, you know exactly what it means. We tried to find happiness. And we got our heart broken. We got our heart broken by some man or woman who we thought loved us. We got our heart broken because we thought if I could just climb this ladder of success, I'd be satisfied. And now we are bound and troubled and oppressed. And our life is a life of pressure every moment of every day. People under the sound of my voice who got addicted to something. And in the beginning, that substance gave you and now it only takes from you. We've all known what it is to have our heart ripped up because we've tried to find a savior in someone, someone or something that couldn't do it. You know what, some of you, by the way, the, the most brightest, happy-faced, joy-filled people in this auditorium, a lot of them are the people that you got down to the very bottom and Jesus came looking for you. You went all the way out to the perimeter and you didn't think there was any coming back and you knew you couldn't be good enough to earn God's favor and you knew you couldn't be right enough. But listen, unlike this story, your older brother, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven. He came from the far country. He came from the glories of angels who rushed to do his bidding. He came down to planet earth and wrapped himself in a human body. And for 33 years, he lived a pure, perfect life that you hadn't lived. He lived a hard life and a misunderstood life. And then he died on a Roman cross. And here's why he was dying. He was paying for every filthy, vile thing we've ever done or thought. So that he could put his record of lifelong obedience like a robe around our shoulders. And the Father could come and run to us and embrace us just like we are as his sons. And shower us with kisses because the goodness of his own son was placed on our account. Friend, you know what? The Father's house is yet to come. We're living in some banged up stuff right now, y'all. We look around on, on the, the, the world scenario and there's so much violence and so much pain and so much impending trouble. And we don't know where our America, this America we love, we don't know where it's going to be in 20 years. We feel sometimes like, like we're on the decline and the rest of the world is on the rise and we see it and we wonder how things are going to work out. Friend, let me tell you, if you're in the Father's house, if the Son came and got you and brought you back to God, let me tell you how it's going to work out for you perfectly. 
He is bringing you to a place with a perfect body and a perfect mind and a perfect world and a perfect planet earth and a perfected heaven. And listen, you're going to be with Christ for all eternity in joy you cannot comprehend if we tried to describe it. All because he loved you so much he came looking for you. I want to close with this. You may be here today. And I have met people all along life's path, especially in these recent few years. Some who would say it, and some who I believe felt it keenly but wouldn't say it, but it dripping out of every pore of their existence. You're here this morning and you feel like God can't save somebody like you. You've gone too far. You've done too much. You wish there was something you could do. You wish there was some way you could repay God for all the sins you've committed. You wish there was some way he could call you son. But you know you've gone too far. You've done too much. I sat in my office early years of my ministry with a man who right before I left that church and went on to the next phase of my ministry said, before you go, I've got to tell you. There was a moment in my life and he began to tell me the story. He said, I killed a man. I killed a man and it was in self-defense. But I can't get over it. I took his life. I took everything he ever had or was ever going to have. I took him from his wife and his kids. And I don't, think, I don't think God can forgive me. Listen, you may be here this morning. And you have gone to some extremes. Maybe you're sitting this morning addicted to something. Maybe alcohol, maybe drugs, maybe pornography. But it is controlling you. It cracks the whip. It says jump and your body and mind ask how high. You may be here this morning, you've lived in immorality, you've gone from one bed to another, you've gone down into dark places, you'd die if anyone knew. How shadowy your life has been, how much of your soul you've given away in bedroom after bedroom. And you wish you could come back to God. But you think he takes good people. He takes moral people. He takes people who can somehow deserve it. Oh, friend, I wish I could tell you. I can only ask the Holy Spirit to tell you. You don't have to try and clean up to come back to God. You come to God like you are and he'll clean you up. You come to God, listen, you got to get real. you got to embrace the fact, I've tried to be my own Savior. I've tried to let freedom be my God. God, I ran away from you, and I went after these things, and it's broken my heart, but I want to be done with that. And Jesus, if you died for me, if you rose again for me, if you can bring me back to a God who will run to me and smother me with his affection and accept me like I am, I'll take it. Friend, I want to tell you, whatever you've done, wherever you've been, Jesus Christ, Christ will save you right here and now. He'll save you this day. He'll bring you back today, not because you're good, but because he is great. He can do it. And one word to my Christian friends. If you have come out of a life of younger brother living, there is no guarantee that those things won't tempt you greatly, even as a Christian. For some of you right now, you're beginning to walk those old paths again. You are drifting back into those shadowy alleys again. And friend, I want to remind you, the same Jesus who saved your soul came to save your life. That stuff is going to break you down. It's going to bury your heart. This same Savior 
I believe, will embrace you and give you what you're truly looking for, which is a place in the Father's house at his table. So you've got to get real today. You've got to quit playing games today. You've got to quit being, being so upstanding And let this church be what it's meant to be, a hospital for sick people. All you well people, we're going to talk to us next week. Because you're not near as well as you think you are. But I wonder if there's a sick person here today. I wonder if there's somebody, nobody has to tell you about your sin. You are living with it and eating and breathing it every moment. And I'm telling you, Jesus came to set you free. Let's all stand. I was so glad last week to hear the report and to meet him this morning of a young man last Sunday who came down from that balcony at the invitation and walked down an aisle and said, I need to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. And he came to me this morning and said, last week, I got saved, preacher. I got saved last week. You know what he's saying? Not that he reformed, not that he improved and now God accepted him he's saying he came to this savior like he was and the savior said come on oh friend I can't talk anybody into anything I'm not even going to try but if you're here this morning and you've never let him be your savior Stop trying to let everything in the world and everyone in the world be your Savior and let the true and living Savior do what he came to do. You may need to come down here and take me by the hand so a counselor can talk to you. You may need to come and ask Christ to forgive your sin. Tell him what you are. Tell him what you're not. Ask him to be your Savior. You can do that down at an altar. For some of you, you can do that right there at your seat. God's here this morning. We've said it a thousand times closer than the air we breathe. Younger brother, he already came to get you. Why not let him bring you back today? Put a robe around your shoulders. Put a ring on your finger. Put shoes back on your feet. Start giving you some feasting instead of the famine you've been living with. I'm going to pray, and this altar, these altars are open. Our counselors are here. We're going to go and seek the one who sent his son. Tonight, that's what the tonight's about. We celebrate the one who loved us so much. It cost him everything to bring us back, but he was willing and ready to pay the price. That's why we can gather here today. Lord, we come before you. We've been here before you. Oh, God, for the one who's standing there. Oh, with clenched teeth, with hand on the back of that seat, grabbing it tight. Because they're scared of what you'll do. They're afraid to come before you, afraid of how you'll change their life, addicted to something that they've never been satisfied with, but they're scared to let go. God, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will draw them in with such beauty and such a strong pull on their heart that today will be the day they let you save. They see you in this parable. They see your affection. They see how free is your grace. Somebody accepts you today that some younger brother comes home today. Lord Jesus, do it for your name's sake. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.